Okay, um, in terms of travel, um, part of retirement for us, um, I've, I've got a got a stepmother in Sarasota, Florida, who has Alzheimer's and in assisted living. And so we travel down there relatively frequently to check in on her and the house and just to, to take care of things. Somewhere in one of my drives back and forth, a straight, straight drive is 16 hours if I do it by myself. Um, but gives you an idea how far it is. But in one of those travels, drives, I started thinking about what was I going to do for Bible class? And I started thinking about traveling. And I thought, you know, there's there's a lot of people in the Bible that travel. I like to travel, you know, and I'll say to start the class travel, especially international travel, which we'll talk about a little bit, isn't for everyone. But I will submit that travel provides experiences that can inspire you, can transform your faith. You can experience new cultures, different way of life, different ways of life. It gives you an opportunity to see the world. It gives you an opportunity to see God's beautiful creation. Um, it, it just, it's a vast world. And I'm just a teeny, tiny little piece of it. Travel also forces you to go out of your comfort zone. Um, you, when you do that, you broaden your horizons, you stretch yourself. Um, and we're going to look at all these things tonight in our class. I just, just as a side note, I, as I was preparing this class, I didn't realize that the daily readings were going to be in the later, latter part of Acts with all of Paul's travels. We're going to talk about Paul's travels in a little bit, but as I've been, I, I usually listen to the daily readings as I've been listening to them. I've got a new appreciation for all of Paul's travels after putting together this class. So hopefully you'll do the same to um, just think about the, the words that are on the page or the, the voices that you hear reading at the Bible in the daily readings. And maybe it'll help you understand Paul a little bit better. I also found it interesting just class, what was it? Two weeks ago, the John Perks did class, um, and some of the, the words he used in his class, he was talking about navigate or compass or direction. Travel is just wrapped into our normal um, everyday language, and so it's something that we're all familiar with one way or the other, one way or the other, near or far, short or long distance, international, domestic, we're all familiar with travel. What I want to start out with and what I like to do in, in a lot of my classes is just start out with some quotes about travel, quotes in, in, in a verse or two too, also, just to sort of set the, set the scene here. My first quote is, my life, my life is my journey with God. It may be hard sometimes, but I am assured it will all be worth, be all worth it. So this journey of life, you know, and I was thinking about that verse when I thought about nowadays, we hop on a plane, a few hours later, we're somewhere. My grandfather didn't like to fly, but he didn't like to fly because he liked to drive and experience the journey along the way. You know, whenever Dana and I are on a little two-lane road going through, not on the interstate, but on a two-lane road, I always say, you know, granddaddy would have enjoyed this. You know, this is this is that journey, the, the experiences you have. And whatever those experiences are in our journey of life with God, it's all worth it. Another quote, difficult roads often lead to beautiful destinations. I was thinking about this when I think it was Ben on Sunday during Steve's Sunday School talked about the New Hampshire 48. I may get that wrong, but I, that's, I, I scribbled a note real quick on Sunday. But, you know, sometimes it is difficult to get to those places, but oftentimes it does lead to a beautiful destination. Another quote, every choice we make along the path has consequences for the journey. 
I'm actually in our ecclesia on this upcoming Sunday, sort of spoiler alert, spoiler alert for anybody who's in our ecclesia. I'm going to be talking about this a little bit, sort of in connection with tonight's class, because we do have choices. It talks about in Deuteronomy, you know, choose life. But our choices, you know, there, there are two gates, the wide gate and the narrow gate. There's two ways, the broad way, the narrow way, a difficult way. There's two groups, the many and the few. And there's two destinations, destruction and life. So we have a lot of choices to make in life, and those choices have consequences on our journey of life. Elizabeth Elliot said once, it is God to whom and with whom we travel. And while he is the end of every journey, he is also at every stopping place. I really, really like that one. Really like that one. You know, it's again, it goes back to my life. The first quote, my life is my journey with God. God is always there with us. And then finally is Psalm 95, 4. In whose hand are the depths of the earth? The peaks of the mountains are his also. So these verses and these quotes, this verse and these quotes are to set the, the stage for the class tonight and to talk about Bible travelers and to talk about our, our travel in life. Before we go to some of those uh, more specific details, I wanted to just interject a little humor, a little travel humor. I found this recently, my first one. So here's a car going forward. The, the car is called Time. You've got last year, next year, and Christ's return. And the child in the back seat is saying, are we there yet? And the parents are saying, not yet, but we're getting closer. That's where we are today in our journey, in our travels. We're getting closer. I believe we're getting very, very, very close. It's just around the next corner. But James 5.8, you too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. So next time you're driving in a car with your kids or your grandkids and you hear that, are we there yet? Um, just think about this, this little comic strip and say, eh, no, but we're getting closer to Christ's return. The other comic I found, and I, I just, I really enjoyed this one. So, you know, on your GPS, was it must've been Steve talking about it last Sunday because he did everything Sunday. Um, but he talked about GPS and maps. You know, on your GPS, it says when you're traveling, it says you'll be arriving in 25 minutes or you'll be arriving when I go to Florida in 16 hours. Well, here's the one I really enjoyed. Here's Moses wandering in the wilderness. Arriving in 40 years? That can't be right. So there you go. We'll, we'll leave it at that. I just enjoyed that one very much when I saw that. I, I asked Dana, I said, can I use that? Is that okay? She's like, oh, yeah, that's fine. So you can blame her if you'd like but I'll take credit for it if you like it. Okay, next, let's talk a little bit about travel today. Like I said, I can make it to Sarasota, Florida from my house in 16 hours if I'm by myself because I'm just flying down the road, 16 hours. It's not that far. You know, I can make it to Chicago in two and a half hours and I'm in a different world than I am here on our farm. I mean, we live in a little town, 450 people. We've got a farm with all sorts of animals and hay fields and stuff. Chicago is a different animal altogether, but you can get there so quickly. And have you ever really thought about how comfortable it is to travel in the 21st century? You know, I, I think back to my my grandparents' car traveling in, the, in my grandparents' car back in the late 60s. It was bare bones, basic, not a whole lot of bells and whistles. Today, let's say let's say I'm I'm a, I'm a child, and I get in the back seat of my parents' car. So I'm riding in my SUV in my parents' SUV, going to my grandparents' house on a hot summer day. I'm going to be sitting on a covered cushion seat. I'm going to have the air conditioning blowing on me. You know, I'm going to complain. Oh, it's a little too hot, a little too cold. You know, there's going to be a bump in the road. I may be plugged in and listening to my favorite songs. I might be watching a movie on an electronic device. I, you know, it's, I don't want to be disturbed. I just, I get a little annoyed when I'm riding down the road. In a few hours, let's, let's call it, I don't know, three hours, I can make the 
three hours, 200 mile trip to my grandparents' house, you know, over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we go. It only takes half a tank of gas. You know, you get there just in time for, for lunch or for supper and you got grandma's home cooking. You know, the biggest frustration in travel in the 21st century was, is sometimes it just takes too long. You know, if you're a child sitting in the back seat, are we there yet? It just takes too long. So I want to contrast that with travel and Bible times. And this is probably, I, I should turn the class over to, to Rich and let Rich talk about all the history of travel and Bible times. He'd probably do, give it a lot more, do, do a lot better job than I would. But I want to think about the, the contrast between travel in the 21st century and travel in Bible times. First off, Bible times, you're walking almost everywhere you go. You're walking to work, you're walking to the synagogue, you're walking to your relatives. Your relatives may live as far as 30 miles away. You may have to walk to grandma and grandpa's house. You know, when, when God presented to Abraham the land of Canaan, God said in, in Genesis 13, he said, lift, up, lift your eyes now and look for the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. 2,000 years later, Jesus arrives on the scene. He seems like he's walking everywhere. You know, there, there were animals to use, mules, donkeys, horses, camels, if you're traveling long distance, but walking was still the most common method of travel. I believe it was Mark Hampton in Bible class, or Bible class exhortation, I don't remember, Sunday school, a few weeks ago, talked about the donkey. And, it, and the donkey was the most common beast of burden, most common use of... Uh, way to travel other than walking you know you've got the other options but the donkey was the main thing in in the the land of israel and as i understand it i don't i don't know if mark said this or not but as i understand it a donkey's average journey was about 20 miles a day think about that 20 miles a day think about me driving to florida 1150 miles in 16 hours don't do the math you'll figure out that i was probably speeding um the only animal that the Bible ever mentions Jesus riding on was a young donkey when he rode in Jerusalem during the last week of his life. So Bible travel was uncomfortable. It was tiresome. It was dangerous. It talks about in John, Jesus being wearied after traveling from Judea to a city in Samaria, to Sychar. Um, we're going to talk about Paul later, but I'll just read this passage. We all, we all know it. It says, Paul in 2 Corinthians, he had been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. So this is what it was like, travel in, in the first century. One of the advantages that, that the Jews had in their, their country in Bible times was hospitality shown to traveling strangers both Old Testament and New Testament. Basically, travelers could enjoy something like, not today, but something like bed and breakfast. You know, their donkeys, their camels, their horses, they would be given water, they'd be given hay. The travelers could sleep indoors, sometimes sleep in a tent, um, get a morning meal and be on their way. You know, this is the way it was in Bible times. Um, I submit that's the way it should be today in, in our times. And I will... I will offer to anyone driving through central Illinois ever, if you're ever, like I said, two and a half hours from Chicago, two hours from Indy, three hours from St. Louis, driving through central Illinois, stop and see us at our farm. We'll make it a bed and breakfast for you. We'll put you up. We'll let you, we'll let you go out and, and play with the goats and play with the sheep and play with the dogs and get some eggs. You know, we'll do all that on the farm and make it enjoyable for you, just like it was in the first century. So we, that's, I think, a, a beautiful thing that they had that I think we do have. My, I know my grandfather, when he traveled, he would always find somebody to stop and visit from some time past. You know, we'd be in the car with him and he'd say, oh, let's stop and see so-and-so. And he hadn't seen so-and-so for 30 years, you know, 10 years, two weeks, whatever, 
They would always welcome him in and vice versa. We'd be sitting at his house in Arkansas. Somebody would just show up and say, hey, I was driving down I-40 and thought I'd get off the road and see you. So I think that's where some of those lessons came from. In Bible times, you know, the, the heat of the sun, they would a lot of times travel by night. They'd get to the directions from the stars. You know, they had to be careful with, from thieves. You know, think about the Good Samaritan. You know, they had to worry about animals, wild animals. And in Judges, it talks about Samson, that a young lion came roaring against Samson as he traveled through the vineyards of Timnah. You know, dangerous travel in, in Bible times. Distances were so much different. I've already talked about that, you know, but 15 to 20 miles per day on a walk was about what an individual could do. You know, if they're a large group of people, probably, probably less. But they also needed to worry about water. That was one of the most important things. I mean, I worry about gas when I'm on the road. You know, I'm, I'm one of those who like to take the gas needle right down to the end. And then it's like, oh, I'm in so much trouble. I'm going to run out of gas. I was in North Dakota driving once, and I, I don't know how I got to the next gas station, but... But we got there because North Dakota, you don't have quite as frequent stops. But for Bible times, it was all about water. They were looking for springs of water or wells, and that was important to them. People also traveled in Bible times by boat, you know, whether there's sails or oars. In, in Jonah, it says uh, the men in the boat with Jonah rowed hard using oars to try and reach land. You know, traveling by boat was sometimes scary, sometimes dangerous, bad weather. Certainly, you get tossed on the waves, the stormy weather. We certainly know those stories with Jesus saving his disciples from storms. And, you know, Paul in Acts 27, Paul talks about being shipwrecked and the boat being torn to pieces. And God protected them and the other prisoners that were on the, the boat. Some jumped overboard and swam to safety, safety. Others had to float on pieces of the broken ship. Boat travel could be dangerous, but boats were a big part of the lives of Jesus and his disciples. You know, I think if I, my count was right, four of the apostles were fishermen who used their living, who made their living using boats. Jesus taught from a boat to crowds, you know, and, and when we think about, again, going back to walking, donkeys, horses, camels, mules, boats, whatever they were, those were the modern forms of transportation. We've got in the 21st century, different modern forms of transportation. We need to thank God for them, for those trans modes of transportation. And we need to use those to the glory of God. So what better way to use them to take the name of Jesus with us wherever we go, whatever we do. So that's my history lesson. I wanted to tell you a little bit about tr my travel, and this isn't going to be a travel log, I promise you, but just a, a real quick overview. My grandparents and my mother had the travel bug. You know, Dana's side of the family, they also had the travel bug. We enjoy travel. Dana and I enjoy travel. Lord willing, we're going to travel again this summer to Eastern Bible School, and we're going to travel, Lord willing, to, to Boston, to Stoughton after, after Bible School, just to, to meet all of you face-to-face, -face, those of you who we've not done that with. Um, and, you know, it's travel has just become a part of who we are. So far, so far, I've made it to 49 out of the 50 states. I haven't didn't count the provinces in Canada, but um, I have made it to 49 out of 50 states. I got to get to Alaska one of these days. I was I thought about this as I was preparing. I went back and found a, a little booklet that my grandmother wrote about my mother, and it said by the time my mother was 21, so that would have been 35, 45, 55, 1956, she had been in the, in the book booklet that my grandmother wrote, it said that my mother, by the time she was 21, had been in all 48 lower states. And I paused for a minute and I Googled it. There were only 48 states at the time. You know, Hawaii and Alaska weren't there yet. She'd also been to Mexico and Canada. 
And I say that's not bad for someone back in the 1940s and 1950s. So we've got a long history of, of travel. You know, Dane and I have been blessed to be able to travel to South Africa twice on mission trips. Um, just one quick little story about that. And I'm going to talk about danger later on in travel. We were at a Bible school. We went over to clean up a, a old school. We filled up the back of a pickup truck. Dana got in the front of the truck with pickup truck with the guy who was taking us to the dump. I got in the back of the pickup truck to lay on top of the piece of carpet that was covering the stuff so nothing would fly out. We had no idea who this guy was. And we just say, we put our trust in you, God, and we go off. And we ended up at the dump and we dumped all the garbage and then we went back. Me in the back of the truck, Dana in the front of the truck. And we, we took a mission trip with the boys, my boys, in the, when was it, 2004, five, six, somewhere in there. We went to Jamaica for a mission trip. Um, and that was just a, a beautiful, beautiful time there. In 2005, and this, I was thinking about um, Jason Deneen here. Um, I was, we went to Israel with my sister and her family. So my boys... Um, were teenagers. One day in Israel, the day that Nicholas, my oldest son, was baptized in the Jordan River, we also traveled to northern Israel that day to Banyas. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, to Banyas Waterfall. While we were there, Hezbollah started bombing northern Israel and Kiryat Shemona, which you, I'm sure you've heard in the news lately, and the guys there said, well, normally we'd send you back to the bomb shelter but in Kiryat Shimona, but that's where they're bombing. So we can't do that. So we, they sent us back through what would be the Golan Heights. And we had UN vehicles going the other way. And we're in this, nine of us in this big white bus. And big white bus like, hi, here we are. Look at us. So we go back to Tiberias. And that was also my younger son's birthday. And somewhere that evening, my nephew, who was, I don't know, five or so, six at the time, he said he was doing his alphabet program that day. He said, well, today's a day of bees, baptisms, bombs, and birthdays. So it's a, a good way to always remember that day. You know, I was thinking, too, when, when Rich said that Jason was traveling out west to uh, Zion National Park, you know, some of the travels we've been on to the Grand Canyon, to Utah to Zion to Glacier National Park to Yellowstone to Yosemite. And I was thinking about, you know, those places and thinking about what Ben talked about briefly in Sunday school on Sunday about climbing the top of a mountain and being there and seeing the beauty of it. It's just amazing. Just amazing. Um, I read two books recently that I would highly recommend about travel and Christianity, let's call it. It's by a gentleman named Paul Stutzman. Paul Stutzman um, is a Mennonite man, but he, he lost his wife to cancer. And he wrote his first book. He, he traveled the Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Mount Katahdin. Is it Maine? Brian and Chris can correct me on that one, but Mount Katahdin, I know. Um, it's Maine. And he right. called it um, Hiking Through, One Man's Journey to Peace and freedom on the Appalachian Trail. Just a beautiful, inspiring, inspiring story. And then he did a follow-up book called Bike Across America, My Coast-to-Coast -Coast Adventure and the People I Met Along the Way. He, he biked across from Washington State to Key West, Florida. But just a very inspiring book about travel, Christianity, the people, and the experiences. So, I want to tell you just one more one more quick story is it's a it's a a lot of time travel is about the people. Travel is about the people. It's not just about me going to experiencing the views or me having the adventure. And we're going to talk about people and faith and stuff here in in just a moment. But the people that you can experience are just incredible. I've got one main story here to tell you when we were in Florida last year, yeah, last year, February of 23. So it was, what is that? I'll do the math. Six months after the big hurricane down there. 
they and I went down to Sanibella and Captiva Island to help for a day or two with the, the um, hurricane cleanup. And while we were there, we went out on the beach one day before we were scheduled to go start with the cleanup. And Dana went and sat down on a pile of shells. So Sanibella Island is one of the top places in the world for shells. So Dana went and sat down on a pile of shells and there was a, a, a blanket there and Dana thought, well, this pile is big enough. Somebody can share. Make a long story short, a woman came over, sat down. She and Dana started talking, had a lovely, lovely conversation. This woman is from Ohio, outside of Cleveland. She operates um, coffee shops and other businesses that help people with disabilities. The people with disabilities run their coffee shops. We went over to visit her recently to see her in action, to see their, their information in action. Dana taught a class while she was there on gardening for, for um, Teresa's businesses, but all because of a conversation during travel. So you never know where, where life might, might lead you to. Um, okay, let's go to the next list. The next list I have is a very incomplete list of Bible travelers. You know, I tried to go through and say, okay, let's pick the highlights, and we're, we're going to do that, my highlights, in a few minutes. But when you really start to look at Scripture and see how many people are traveling, everybody is going somewhere, doing something. So I want to just go through this list relatively quickly and just highlight each person here. First off, Noah and his descendants. You know, they had to migrate from the, the Mount Ararat area to Babel. You know, that's that's where, in, excuse me, Genesis 11. Genesis 12, Abraham trusts God, and he travels from Ur of the Chaldees to the land of Canaan. And once he's there, he's got to leave Canaan and go to Egypt. Talks about that in all Genesis 12. We're going to go back and look at Abraham in a few minutes. Rebecca. Rebecca had to leave her homeland uh, to be Isaac's wife in Canaan, Genesis 24. Isaac, like his father Abraham, Isaac had to, had to command um, Jacob not to marry a Canaanite woman, but to return to his family, family's people for a wife. Jacob, we're going to look at Jacob too. Jacob, as he's going, he had to, he was wrestling an angel. He's, he's going from Haran to Bethel. Joseph, not by choice necessarily, but Joseph traveled. And even when Joseph traveled, he was put by God in position to aid his family when they had to travel, when they had to flee the drought in Canaan. Moses, I mean, we could I, we could do the whole class on Moses and his travel. Actually, I did a class on Moses for, for Stoughton class one night, so we're not going back there again. But Moses' travels from Egypt and on in, and in Midian and, and everywhere else, you know, and just lots and lots of travel. The children of Israel, going back to that cartoon that I showed earlier. You know, there's Moses, there's the children of Israel wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. God eventually leads his people back from Egypt to Canaan, and Abraham's line comes full circle, showing God's promises are not forgotten. Ruth, you know, Ruth, there's famine and God's people, and Ruth is called to go out of Moab back to Bethlehem and return them. Saul, you know, when when in the days when the Israelites were looking for a king, God said, Saul, I want you to, in 1 Samuel 9, said, I want you to go from Gibeah to Ramah. You know, so he had to travel. Samuel had to travel. He had to go from Bethlehem to, to anoint David. He had to leave and, and anoint David. Jonah, we talked about Jonah in the, in the boat. Jonah had to go to Nineveh. David, I mean, David just, we're going to go on, uh, narrow down on David in a few minutes. But, you know, when, when David was anointed, God said, I want you to go to Hebron. So David went. Elijah traveled all over, you know. Um, he went up to Mount Horeb, and he's, he's going here and there and everywhere. Naaman. Naaman had to go and travel from Syria to Samaria just to be healed by God. Think about the captives in Judah. What I'm hoping is that as we're looking at this list, as you read these stories, 
you see the travel that the, we, we just read the, the, the words on a page. And sometimes we don't think about the struggles of travel, which is why I did that longer section on the travel in Bible times, because the, to think about the captives of Israel, this, this is a lot of people all moving together, going back to Jerusalem. You know, Joseph going down to Bethlehem, you know, the Romans were accomplices to God's will. When Caesar Augustus issued the decree saying that a census has to be taken, Joseph had to travel to Bethlehem. The kings at Jesus' birth, traveling, when they, 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 they heard, heard the news that Jesus had been born. You know, Philip, Philip wants this, what's it called? Um, the Great Commission, go into all the world. You know, so Philip, he goes into Samaria in Acts chapter 8. Saul is on his way to Damascus when he's converted on the road, Saul slash Paul, but we'll call him Saul here in this first part of the travel, on his way to Damascus. Barnabas, Barnabas traveling from Jerusalem, planting a church in Antioch and traveling other places around around the area. Paul, we're going to get down into Paul later with his travels. Um, but, you know, Paul himself went, well, I'm not going to go there yet. We'll go there in a few minutes. And then Jesus, we're going we're gonna to narrow down on Jesus too in a few minutes. Just think of Jesus as being a traveler. Okay. So those are some of the things I want you to, the, the, the stories, as you read the stories, the next week, month, year, as you think about these, just think about travel. Think about travel. I said earlier that travel can help increase faith. And we're going to look at five of the folks that we've just talked about in this incomplete list and look at how their faith was increased by their travel. So we're going to look at Abraham, we're going to look at Jacob, we're going to look at David, we're going to look at Paul, and we're going to look at Jesus. So we're, I want to show, I hope, I want to show how these men of old, when they traveled, their faith, how their faith fit together with their travel. I think the most obvious, in my mind, is Abraham. Abraham was faithful enough to pack up his household, having no idea where he was going. Why? Because he trusted God. You know, he had no clue. God says, take all your family, take all your possessions, and go. He was willing to go. I mean, to me, this is just a, a, a proof of how strongly Abraham said, God, wherever you're going to lead me, it's got to be better than where I am because this is where you want me to go. You know, and, and all the other trust and the faith, this, this is our first indication of Abraham's faith. But then you get into Genesis 22, and he's asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. You know, where is where did his faith start and where did it grow? As he's journeying, as he's traveling, God strengthened Abraham's faith during his travels, during his journeys. So I think about the experiences Abraham had along the way in his travels. I think about the breathtaking views that he had. You know, just being out there on a plane and looking at the sunrise and the sunset and saying, thank you, God, for being with me. I don't know where I'm going, but I trust you. The lesson is for us, where is God going to lead us? Is God going to call us to go somewhere that we don't know? And instead of saying, well, I need to make sure I have this in place, this in place, this in place, this in place. And then I'm going to question, why am I doing this, God? Why am I? Sometimes it's a matter of just go. Just go. 
like I, I told you our story in South Africa when we jumped in a pickup truck with a guy and went to the dump, you know, which was, it wasn't close. I don't remember how far it was, but it took us a while to get there. It was just jump in the, jump in the truck, have faith that God will watch over us wherever we're going. So there's Abraham. Let's look at Jacob for a minute. Jacob had to travel alone to survive. And along the way, he saw God provide for him. So he took his brother's blessings, and then he had to rush out of Canaan, go visit Uncle Laban. Along the way, he wrestles with an angel. Is this strengthening his faith? Is that part of the journey, that part of the travel, strengthening his faith? Then with Leah and Rebecca and Laban and everything else that was happening there, not necessarily travels, per se, but the journey, as it were, Jacob's faith is being grown all the way. When he goes back, when he travels back to Canaan, he had so much more flocks and herds and children than he had when the first time he went on that journey, when he went back, that piece of the travel was so much different, as was his faith, as was his faith. David, you know, I talked about David being anointed and, and God saying, I want you to go to Hebron. But think about David in the Psalms. David, you know, the difficulties that he had to, to face just waiting for the promises of God. He had to flee for his life. He had to hide in caves. You know, the perseverance that he showed during this testing period caused him to write some of the most beautiful, beautiful words we've ever read in Psalms, showing his character, showing how he grew his faith muscles during this time. During King Saul, you know, continually pursuing um, David and just always having to keep on foot in the desert, you know, of Judea. So the character growth, the faith growth, he became, as we're told, a man after God's own heart. So these travels of David, you don't, I don't think of that travel in the same way as I do Abraham, but it was. It was going here, it was going there, it was going there, always continually moving and traveling. That's what David was doing. Traveling is, for David, you know, it's it's not always easy. Sometimes it's challenging. I think I'm a, I'm a pretty laid back person, pretty easygoing person. But the most stressful time is trying to get through the airport, through security, to your gate, knowing you're going to get there on time and not miss your plane. I'm sure you felt that. You know, it's like, ah, oh, am I going to make it or not? So, but life, it, it can be difficult. It can be challenging. It can be dangerous. We talked about that earlier. You know, it's it's tiring. It's not easy. Poor David. I mean, David just, again, going here and there and everywhere. You know, so all of this helps to improve perseverance, helps to build character, helps to build faith. These challenging journeys, these challenging travels, going to these challenging destinations. For David, it was worth all the effort and all the pain. So think about that with David. With Paul, we could do a whole class on, well, Rich did that, a number of classes on Paul and some of his travels. But I already read the verse to you from 2 Corinthians about the shipwrecks and, you know, and all that. But Despite all these, Paul just kept going. I mean, Paul was like the Everetti Bunny. He just kept going and going and going despite the threats, despite the hardships, despite the prison sentences, you know, everything. He just kept going. As I was preparing for this class, I, I read a note somewhere that said, let me re read this to make sure I've got it right, that it's estimated that Paul traveled over 10,000 miles on his journeys and established at least 14 new churches. So 
10,000 miles in a fairly compact area. Fairly compact area. So a lot of traveling pulled in. And, you know, even though it was dangerous for Paul, it was worth the risk. And sometimes there's things in life that can only happen if we're willing to take a risk. There's greater opportunity to see God's protection if we take a risk. Now, I'm not saying be crazy and go nuts, but sometimes just go a little bit a little bit further. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes too. But So think about that, taking risk and looking at the journey and looking at how God watches over us and takes care of us. Finally, Jesus of my, I won't call it top five because I think there's a lot of others we could talk about too, but the five that I chose. We don't, I don't, think about Jesus traveling, but when you think about the fact that he was walking practically everywhere in his life, crossing seas by boat, you know, hiking mountains, withdrawing to the mountain to pray or to the wilderness to pray, you know, I I, I think I share that but again, Ben talked about it on Sunday briefly, that intimacy with God whenever I go to the mountains. You know, here in central Illinois, it's a far cry from a mountain, a far cry from a mountain. But when when I'm in the mountains somewhere, I just, I, I, I find a deeper connection, a deeper connection. So after, after I retired in November, Dana and I went out to Sedona, Arizona in the Grand Canyon. And one day, Dana and I hiked up to, in Sedona, hiked up to a place called the Coxcomb. So like a rooster, the Coxcomb, that's what it looks like from a distance. But we hiked out and about and up and up and up and up. And we got to the top and we sat on a, sat on a overlook looking out over the valley and you can see if you've ever been been to Sedona or seen Sedona, it is gorgeous. But just being there, nobody else was around. No one was around. The quietness of it, the intimacy with God when you're in a place like that is just so beautiful. So I can understand when Jesus had to withdraw to the mountains or to the, to, to the wilderness, to the Garden of Gethsemane, wherever he went, just to have the intimacy with God and to be alone in God's creation. Just, again, just, just beautiful, I think. Okay, what I want to do in the last few minutes of class is I like to end class typically with just looking at a number of verses, just to sort of cement. I start with some quotes and a verse, give you some examples, some history, some examples of my own travel. We look at some, some Bible travelers. And now I want to close with some different verses and some of the lessons that apply to us, that can apply to us. First off, a lesson on safety. In Psalm 121, it says, The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time and forever. God will watch over us in our travels. We put our trust in him. In Luke 4, it says, For it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you. You know, just the other night, Dana and I were sitting on the front porch having dinner, and we've got a little conversation box just to give you interesting questions. And the question, I don't know if the question came from that box or Dana just asked it out of the blue, but, you know, she, her, the question was, have you had any experiences with, with angels? And I immediately went to a, a trip going to a Bible school. We were over in Indianapolis. We got lost going through Indianapolis, delayed by a little bit. When we got to the other side of Indianapolis, finally, and going on, what's that, east, huge, huge accident. Did the angel help us to get lost so we weren't in the middle of it? Timing-wise, it was right there. It was right there. You know, this, the angels looking over us, it says in Proverbs 3, then you will walk in your way securely and your foot will not stumble for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. So 
with angels watching over us and protecting us. You know, I, I find it interesting. One of the most dangerous, I think it's, I think it's on the list of most dangerous hikes in the U.S. is in Zion National Park. Again, I don't know if, if Jason's on tonight or if, if he's still out in Zion, but it's called Angels Landing. And Dana and I were at Zion a number of years ago, and we took, we started going up to Angels Landing. You go on this switchback called, what was it called? Walter's Wiggles, back and forth, back and forth. You get up there, you're walking along, holding on to a chain, walking past people and looking down 600 feet, I don't know. And we got to a certain point and Dana's like, are we there yet? And some guy was there and he said, no, that's where you're going. And we looked up and said, no, we're not. And so I think Angel's Landing was a good term for it because for me to go on that, I would have to see my angel holding on to me to, to take that trip. Next lesson, just to trust in God during your trip. In Psalm 23, we, we all know. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Trust in God during your trip. That's I think what Psalm 23 is saying to us. In Deuteronomy 31, and the Lord is the one who is going ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not desert you or abandon you. Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Trust in God. He will take care of you. Psalm 139. If I take up the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will take hold of me. And Judges 18, then they said to him, inquire God, please, that we may know whether our way in which we are going will be successful. And the priest said to them, go in peace. Your way in which you are going has the Lord's approval. Trusting in God during our trip. Letting God be in control, I think this is a lesson for us. Goes hand in hand with the last one, but Proverbs 16, the mind of a person plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. It's sort of the let go and let God. Let God direct your steps. I can do all my planning, all my logistical planning, but at the end of the day, God's going to take care of me. It sort of goes back to that Elizabeth Elliot quote I had earlier that God's at the end of the journey, but he's all the way along. He's all he's with you all along the way. Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If you've ever been in utter darkness, and I think I, I think I said this during a class one time here, but took a trip to, uh, we had a Bible study weekend at Merrimack Caverns, Missouri years ago. My brother and I and, I and a friend climbed over a fenced off wall that we weren't supposed to go into in a cave. We had our flashlights. We walked back into the cave. We, fi we finally said we better turn around. The three of us, we turned back around. All of a sudden, there were all these forks left and right, our flashlight started dying, and flashlight died. And that was utter darkness. Finally, way off in the distance, I could hear Dana yelling, Ray, Ray, are you there? And we followed, and obviously we made it out. We're here today. But I think, I, I think about that often when I read this verse. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Without that word, we are in utter darkness. And think about this, what's it called again? The Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Uh, Mark 16, preach the gospel to all creation. Whether you're preaching the gospel locally, whether you're preaching on mission trips, wherever you're going, this is part of our travel. We should be doing this as we travel. You know, that was part of Dana's conversation with this lady, Teresa, in on um, Captiva Island in Florida on the pile of shelves was a pile of shells. They started talking about um, God in the Bible, you know, and that's, they, they have had an immediate connection. So opportunities to do that frequently. Again, the, some of these subjects are similar in lessons, but I, I think some verses fit better with some. This is letting God lead the way in Exodus 13. And the Lord is going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light 
so that they might travel by day and by night. God led them. Do we let God lead the way for us? Or do we say, nope, I'm in charge, I'm going to lead. And then walking the path that God's laid out. Psalm 18, you enlarge my, excuse me, you enlarge my steps under me and my feet have not slipped. God has set a path for us to walk on. And all too often, I will veer off to one side or the other and will trip and fall. You've all, I've told you all this before. I'm a runner and I, I enjoy running on roads. I enjoy doing trail, trail runs. And I've fallen on trail runs. And, you know, you, you've got to watch carefully where you walk. But knowing that God is creating that path, and if we walk on that path, that will help us and our feet will not slip. I think the last verse I have here is reminding that all are welcome. Luke 13, they will come from east and west, from north and south, will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Have you ever thought about travel in the kingdom? What will that be like? That's another class. We're not doing that tonight. But if the travel coming from east and west, north and south, the kingdom of God. Are we there yet? It's not far off.